Do you guys remember this story? Yeah, we yeah. read it last night. You read it last night? That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, I have the song memorized. Oh, too. what's the song? So let's see. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I don't remember the rest of it. First, okay, about how tall was Zacchaeus? Can you show me with your hands? Sure, yeah, pretty good. Okay, now, what did Zacchaeus do to the tree? Show me. He climbed, and then when he got up there, who did he see? Jesus! Jesus, I love you! And Jesus told him to do what? Go down to the Come down. Down. Calm down. Whose house did Jesus go to? Zacchaeus! He went to his house, and what did they do at the house? Anybody know? Um, they talk. They talk, they're good. What would it be like to talk? They say, like, that's my house. Uh -huh. yeah. And then at the end, Zacchaeus was different. What would it look like to be different? Oh, different. I like it. Yes. <laughs> like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I love these videos, and we're going to miss this. This is the finale of our series, Kids Stories, Adult Version, I know. Uh, and so each week we have that video, and then either Brittany or I have started the gathering in the annex, reading the story to the kids. And one of the benefits of this series is that every generation is talking about the same story. So parents, take advantage of this. I hope that our kids ask us questions, and let's ask our kids questions. And if you're a parent and you're like, that scares me to death, then just email Brittany at publicchurch.com. She can connect you with some parents and help you learn how to talk to your kids about Jesus. If you need a Bible, go to the Info Hub. If we run out, we'll order you one. We want to help make that happen. And if you're an adult, you may be like, okay, I like the kid's story, but why do I need the adult version? Well, there's a quote we've come back to throughout this series to let us know why, and it's this, faith that is not allowed to grow up will not bear up under the pressures of life. So as we move the adult version, we want to give our faith a chance to grow up so that it will bear up. So here's a question to get us into the adult version. Have you ever sized someone up and judge them. In fact, authenticity, if you're online, if you're in the lobby, if you're in the room, raise your hand if you ever judge somebody. Raise your hand. Okay, if your hand is not raised, you're judging the rest of us right now. So put your hand up. You're with us. Sometimes we just do this. We size people up, okay? And sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. And then have you ever sized yourself up? Maybe you size yourself up and be like, man, I got this or I do not have this. And especially when it comes to how we think Jesus views us or how we think Jesus views others, we can size other people up and judge them. And there's some people that we can look at and go, you know what, if the boundaries of God's love are here, you're just right here. And there's some of you that aren't even in the same zip code. And we can literally think people are too far gone. Or some of you might look in the mirror and go, I think I'm too far gone. So one of the reasons I love this story is because it really confronts our preconceived notions both about others and about ourselves. And if we will let it, it forces us to begin to see others and ourselves the way Jesus sees us. So I hope that can happen for all of us today as we are in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, if you want to join me there in your Bible or Bible app. Last week, Matt Moore, our Akoi Region FCA director, did a phenomenal job. Matt's right over here. Can we honor him? Here is a prayer that Matt gave us last week that I've been praying and it has really helped me this week and it's just simply this, Lord, help me respond to what you have versus reacting to what I don't. I'm telling you, that was just so helpful. If you want to go back and listen to Matt's talk or the rest of the series, you can find that on YouTube or Spotify. And actually, this is our third year of this series, and we're doing it again next July because we planned this series in two-year increments. Brittany and I have already collaborated and picked out the stories for next year. So you can go back and check out the ones in the past and come back next July for another rendition of kids' stories, adult versions. And before we dive in, I also just want to challenge us that as school is starting, let's make sure that we're a church that is praying for our schools. We have two tangible opportunities to do that coming up. One is this Friday at Blythe Bower. If you're available and you could come by Blythe Bower at 4 p.m., a couple of the principals there are part of our church family, and we are honored to be invited in and just pray through the hallways, pray over classrooms. And then the following Saturday, August 10th at 10 a.m. during our normal Saturday prayer time, we're going to meet at Stewart Elementary School and pray there. So what a privilege 
that we live in a community where some school leaders are inviting us to come in and pray over their schools. I'm just so thankful for that. And then one last thing before we dive in, and this is very rare for me, but I actually want to dedicate this talk to every single one of you who has something to do with education, whether you are a student, a cafeteria worker, um, whether you are a traffic, what is the word? Crossing guard, thank you so much. It just left. A crossing guard. Whether you're a principal, whether you work at the central office, I just want to dedicate this to you because as I was preparing for this, there was a moment that it shifted, and I really believe that if you're involved in education, Jesus has you here, has you watching, maybe wants you to share this with another friend in education to get you ready for what he wants to do through you in school. I believe that he wants to give you his eyes to see your classmates if you're a student, to see your students if you're a teacher, to see your colleagues, no matter what kind of role that you have. And so I just want to invite us to lean in. And look, I've been a teacher. That's in my past. And so I know the end service is coming and you're going to get super inspired. Okay. (laughs) I sat through it too. So I'm not promising that today will be more inspiring than in service. I'm just saying Jesus might want to do something in you if you give him a chance, all right? So Luke chapter 19, verse 1, it says this, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, now real quick, something that I've observed, not just in this story, but in Jesus' life, is he passes through places a lot differently than I do. When I pass through something, I got my head down, I don't want to talk to anybody, and I am walking fast because I've got somewhere to go. Jesus is focused. There's one time the disciples are like, hey, let's hang out here longer. He's like, no, no, we got to move on. And there is a definite point in his time on earth where he set his face towards Jerusalem. So he's simultaneously focused and interruptible. That's the part I miss. Where as he's going to Jerusalem, he also has time for people in Jericho. I in no way have this figured out. If you do talk to me afterwards, but I just want to be more like Jesus in this area. And I love that Jesus even confronts, at least in me, just the way I carry myself as I'm walking through my everyday life. So Jesus was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Can we all say that name together? Ready? Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Chief tax collector. Here's what that means. Is he basically led an extortion rink, okay? So here's what tax collectors were. They worked for the Roman occupiers, and they were usually Jews, so everybody considered them sellouts. You're working for the oppressors. And they not only worked for them, but they would collect taxes and then some. Now, Zacchaeus was the chief, which means he could have been leading a ring of these people. So he's not only collecting and then some from you, he's collecting off of all his peoples and then some that they're collecting from each other. So, So know this, the people of Jericho would have been horrified to think that 2,000 years later, the one name we know from their city is Zacchaeus. I mean, horrified. They hated this guy. If there's a boundary for God's love, he's not even in the galaxy. Like, he is so far gone. In fact, if we were walking through the streets of Jericho, just try to help us feel what people would have felt, we're walking by Zacchaeus' house, and we're like, ah, oh, he's putting in a new sl- swimming pool, that scumbag. Ah, oh, it's a brand new 2026 Ferrari. I don't even know how you get those. It's 2024 still. And you would have been saying, and I would have been saying, and he's doing that with my money. So I hated this guy. He was despicable, too far gone, way, way, way outside anything God could do. And it says he was seeking to see who Jesus was. That's underlined in my Bible. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. This despicable, scum of the earth, tax collector wanted to know who Jesus was. He was actually curious about Jesus. So could it be that the people in our lives that we look at and we're like, you are too far gone. Could it be that unbeknownst to us, there's actually something in them that's at the very least curious to know who Jesus is. We gotta be careful with our preconceived notions. Because Zacchaeus was doing that. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. And it says, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now, anthropologists think 
that the average adult male was about 5'5 five, five at this time, so he's much shorter than 5'5. Five, five. So this, he's little. The song's true. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. That's true. He was little. And know this. Everybody hates him. So there's not anybody in the crowd that's going to be like, oh, here's Zacchaeus. Let me move so you can see. No, they're going to be like, oh, don't let him see. We hate him. He does not deserve to get a look at Jesus. That's the visual. So it says that what he did is he, he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. Now, now the visual here to get the context is a guy in an Armani suit, like not just any Armani suit, like the top of the line Armani suit for about $3,000 shoes. And he's just like taken off running through town. And you were like, what is going on with Zacchaeus? I don't really care. I don't like the guy anyway. But I mean, this is kind of shocking and it's very undignified for Zacchaeus. But evidently he doesn't care because he just wants to see Jesus. And so he climbs up into this tree. And, and honestly, if not for Jesus, this is the end of the story. Because he just climbs up in a tree. He gets to look at Jesus. Everybody ignores him. Jesus passes on like I often do in my life. And we just move on. But thankfully, Jesus is not like me. And it says what happened is Jesus came to the place. He, he looked up. He looked up into the tree and he saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must... I must stay at your house today. Pause for just a moment. Zacchaeus looked up. Excuse me, Jesus looked up. And he noticed Zacchaeus. Could it be that there are Zacchaeuses in our classroom, on our hallway, janitors who may be Zacchaeus, cafeteria workers? For all of us who aren't in education, could it be that they're checking us out at the grocery store? And scanning our groceries, could it be that all around us serving us lunch today, that Zacchaeuses are all around us? People who are genuinely curious about Jesus and are seeking to see who he is, and the question is, will we notice them? So, so, so how did Jesus notice them? Well, we know from Luke chapter four early in this, it says the spirit of the Lord is upon Jesus. And you should read Luke four. It's just incredible as he announces his public ministry. So, so here's what we know. We know that the Holy Spirit was upon Jesus, guiding him to notice Zacchaeus. And for all of us who follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in us and can guide us to look up and notice the Zacchaeus is around us. But here's the deal. That's probably not going to happen unless we practice listening to his voice. So in the days that I just like wake up and I got to go and I'm out of here and I'm just going, I'm going to go and I don't take time to pray and spend time in the word to start my day and I'm just like off, I'm probably not going to notice Zacchaeus because I did not start my day listening. But what if we turned off the morning show? What if we turned off sports radio and instead we maybe got on the pray first app? And we just let it guide us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Or we opened the Bible and spent some time. And what if we started our day in the presence of Jesus, listening to him? We would be so much more likely to then as we're going throughout our day to be like, ah, Zacchaeus, I hear you, Holy Spirit. So we start our day with him so we can get better at hearing his voice. So when Zacchaeus is there, we don't just pass through. But we look up and realize that we're passing through for a purpose. And that person is part of that purpose. And so what Zacchaeus does next is he says this. He hurried and came down and received him joyfully. I, I don't know the part of this story where Zacchaeus truly repents and becomes a Jesus follower. I'm not sure if it was this moment, but I know this was a big step. Because Jesus told him to do something. And Zacchaeus, he listened to what Jesus said and he did what Jesus said. And if you're here today, if you're watching and, and if you don't follow Jesus, I hope today's the day that you repent, that you just surrender your life to Jesus. But if it's not that, I hope that at least like Zacchaeus, you can take a step toward Jesus today. That's the invitation because Zacchaeus takes a step towards him. He receives him joyfully. Jesus goes into his home and, and what happens is verse seven, it says, when they saw it, they all grumbled. In the original language, think like buzzing of bees. That, that's the word play here. It's just like, bzzz, they're all just grumbling, complaining. And it says this, he has gone in to be the guest of a man, pause, whenever you read this on your own, 
Here's how you need to read this last part of this verse. You read it like this. He has gone in to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. That's how you read this verse. A man who is a sinner. This is an adjective. Like, she's athletic, he's a sinner. Like, that's what they're thinking. They are thinking, what? Of all the people in Jericho, you're going to his house, Jesus? You gotta be kidding me. Because here was the predominant viewpoint then, and I'm telling you, this is still alive and well today, that when people are sinners, when they're far from God, if we associate with them, that makes us complicit. That means that suddenly we are guilty with them. So the way to reach people is just to ostracize them. Don't speak to them. Keep them at a distance. Maybe even look down on them, like help them see, like you're a sinner, mm, and I'm better than you. Like, like act like this. And whatever you do, don't get caught spending time with them. And it's so easy for this to creep in. I know one day I was having lunch with a couple of good friends who don't follow Jesus, and somebody walked in that I used to work with, and my first thought, confession, was, What's she going to think about me because I'm eating with them? It was self-preservation. It was, what about my reputation? And thankfully, in that moment, the Holy Spirit was like, it does not matter what she thinks about you because you're right where Jesus would be. And I needed that truth that he spoke to me that day. Because it's so easy for us to begin to apply our preconceived notions to people or for us to distance ourselves because we don't want to be corrupted by them, but you notice that Jesus is spending time with this sinner because he loves him. And, and just to say this, as we go on throughout the story, spending time with people does not mean that we affirm all their actions. The, the story does not mean that, it does not end by Jesus saying, hey, Zacchaeus, you are a terrible person. It's all right. Just keep doing it. If you could just tie it a little bit, though, to the synagogue, that'd be helpful. But, but you just keep extorting people. You keep doing your thing, Zacchaeus. I love you. No, no, no. He changed by Jesus. So loving people, sitting with them, developing relationships, it does not mean that we're affirming everything they're doing. It means that we're loving them enough to let them see Jesus and let Jesus change them because Jesus changes everything. More on how to do that in just a little bit. So he spends time with them. And look, he changes. Look what happens. It says, I kiss stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now, I read this verse and I'm like, dude, who are you kidding? If you have defrauded, you defrauded most of the town. But in the original language, he's confessing it. It doesn't sound like it sounds in English. He is saying, I've defrauded people and I'm going to give stuff back. Here he goes well beyond the requirements of the law. And just a side note about forgiveness. Let's not cheapen forgiveness, especially when we're the offender. I think sometimes I can be like, well, if I just say I'm sorry, I'm good, we move on. No, no. Forgiveness both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it means that we own it, confess it, and we pursue restoration. Think about it. Would it have been true forgiveness or or, or true repentance if Zacchaeus had been like, hey, guys, I follow Jesus now, but I'm going to keep enjoying your stuff. (laughs) No. You'd be like, "Uh, I don't think he's fully changed. So for us, the question we have to ask is, hey, let's own it. And then is there any way I need to pursue restoration? Look, sometimes there's not. Some damage is irreparable. I think that's one of the reasons Jesus gave us this language in his prayer, which said that we pray, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. There's times that we just have to absorb the debt and we give it to Jesus because we don't have to carry that on our own. But when we're the offender, like Zacchaeus, I think it's really important that we take a moment and, and own it, confess it, and also go, hey, is there anything I need to do to begin to repair or restore this relationship? That's what happens because he's with Jesus. And then it says this, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. I I don't think this is talking about his ethnicity here, although he is an ethnic Jew. I think there's a few things in play here. And one of them is I think Jesus is saying, hey, you guys labeled him too far gone. He is not too far gone. So today, if that's you, if you've labeled yourself too far gone, if you feel like somebody has put that label upon you, today, Jesus looks at you and says, you're a daughter of Abraham, you are a son of Abraham, you are not too far gone. Because, verse 10, Jesus says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek 
and to save the lost. Jesus loves Zacchaeus so much, and he loves you. And to help us get a picture of that, I envision Zacchaeus, and what Zacchaeus did is he, Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see Jesus, but Jesus died on a tree to save Zacchaeus. And that's what he's done for all of us. Zacchaeus may have climbed a tree, but Jesus died on a tree, the tree called Calvary, where he who knew no sin became sin, so we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So if you feel like I'm Zacchaeus, if, if you feel like I may be too far gone, Jesus loved you so much, he pursued you all the way to the cross, through the grave, and out the other side when he rose from the dead. And so your action today, the invitation for you is will you let him save you? Will you repent, like Zacchaeus, turn from sin and turn towards Jesus? And if you want to do that today, if you're watching, just email prayer at publicchurch.com. We'd love to guide you through it. We'd love to talk with you about next steps. If you're anywhere in this room or in the lobby, before you go, just go to the prayer corner so we can talk with you about next steps. The, the, the action for the kids today, the kids' story is that Jesus wants to be your friend. And maybe that's what some of us adults need to know as well. That no matter what we've done, no matter how bad we were, no matter how bad we are, Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead because he loves us and he wants to be our friend. So we accept that friendship today. And for those of us who follow Jesus, what is the adult version of this story? Well, the kid's version, again, is Jesus wants to be our friend. Here's the adult version. We can't seek and save, but we can pursue and invite. We cannot seek and save. Jesus is the only one that can save. He's the one who died and rose again. But we can pursue and we can invite people to follow Jesus. So what in the world does this begin to look like? What does it look like for us to recognize that in our lives this week, there's going to be Zacchaeus is there? Well, as I said earlier, we got to start our day listening. So we're knowing his voice when he says, hey, talk to this person. Hey, spend some time here. That we're listening and we're aware. And I know my pushback is, well, well what if I don't have like 30 minutes at that moment? Look, we're all going to eat. So then maybe it's as simple as, hey, connect with them right then and say, could we get lunch later? Could we get coffee later? And love them with our time. Because pursue, we'll talk about pursue by prayer. We'll end with that. And we've got to do that. But pursue in the most natural sense of the world means to, word means to carve out time with people. Jesus carved out time. He spent time with Zacchaeus. So what does it look like for us to begin to pursue people? And as we do, I think there's a few things that we need to understand. Because we can feel so much pressure when it comes to this. And so maybe you're saying, okay, well, so invite them to lunch. What do I talk about? <laughs> like, 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 what do I do? do? Do do I have to have some like diagram where I can like draw out the gospel? Look, if you know a tool like that, use it as the spirit leads. Those are incredible tools, but you do not have to have something like that. Here's what Jesus is inviting us to do, to get to that lunch, get to coffee, get to time with them, and to love them by listening. Just start by listening to them. You could say something like, hey, tell me your story. You could discover something they're passionate about, and then you could keep asking questions. Just love them like Jesus has loved us genuinely care about them. So many people want to talk. May we be people who listen to them. And oftentimes as they're listening, the Holy Spirit will guide us and show us, hey, there is an opportunity for you to now share the gospel, share at least part of the gospel. So now you're like, oh, uh, what do I do then? Now I'm even more scared. And here's some homework for you. Jesus followers, write the gospel in your own words. If you've never done that, take some time and write the gospel in your own words. We need to know and internalize the gospel. Just read Romans 8. Read Ephesians 2. Read the first part of 1 Corinthians 15. And then just take some time and write it out in your own words. I've been reading through Acts. 
And Peter's got a line that he weaves into almost every gospel presentation. So maybe this is your line as you write the gospel in your own words. Maybe when that gospel opportunity comes, you just look at him and you say this. This is what Peter said. He said, you killed him, but God raised him. You imagine being a bond life and being like, just want to let you know, you killed him, but God praises his name. He raised, okay, maybe that's not your line, okay? That was Peter's line. But my point is this. Know the gospel and then be ready to point them. You got to get to Jesus. You got to get to the cross. You got to get to the empty tomb. You may not get there the first time you spend time with them. It may be a month. It may be two months. Keep loving them by listening. Just value them as a human being made in the image of God whom Jesus died for. And when you have the opportunity, just share the gospel with them. And you're like, but I still feel all this pressure. Here's one of the big things we learned from the story. And one of the things that relieves the pressure is knowing this. We don't bring them Jesus. He's already there. Zacchaeus was seeking to save. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. He was curious. So most of the time, we're not starting a gospel conversation. We're joining an ongoing gospel conversation. Now, admittedly, they may not know it. They may not know that that horoscope they're checking every single day just to try to get some kind of direction and make decisions on their lives. They may not know that they're checking a horoscope, but they're really seeking Jesus. We can help them see that. They may not know that that TikTok influencer whose words they just eat up and they do every single thing that person says, they may not know that that's really the Holy Spirit showing them that there is more that he has to offer, but we can help them see it because we're going to walk in assuming that they are seeking and knowing, man, I don't have to bring Jesus to you. He's already here. I don't have to start a gospel conversation. I just need to join a gospel conversation and let the Holy Spirit use my voice as his voice box. And that relieves the pressure because he's guiding us as we spend time with him, as we share with him. And public worship, they're going to come on up. And as they're coming up and getting ready to sing the song, I just want to give us a glimpse of what this could look like. What would it look like for us to be a church who goes out and notices Zacchaeus and pursues Zacchaeus? What would it look like for all of you guys who are involved in education in some way to go out and be a witness? And, and look, if you're in middle school and high school, we have prayers for the generations. We're going to be praying through 21 days of prayer. And one of the prayers that, that I pray, and I'm sure other people are praying for your generation, is that you would be a bold witness, not just a witness. You'd be a bold witness who points your friends to Jesus. Because I'm telling you, your friends are way more likely to listen to you than they are Sam or any adult. Sam's awesome. We need great adults in their lives. We need teachers that are telling them about Jesus, but you've got their ear. You've got an opportunity to point them to Jesus. So, so here's what this would look like. It could look like somebody in the education field just beginning to sit, to listen, to love by listening, to spend time with them. And it's a little gospel conversation here, and it's a little gospel conversation there, and nothing happens in October, but in February, they repent and follow Jesus. And then they start sharing Jesus with somebody. And maybe somebody else follows Jesus in May. And then somebody else over the course of the summer is just sitting at home going, man, I got questions about Jesus. Oh, I know I can text my friend who loves me and clearly loves Jesus. And they text them. And think about over the course of five years, revival could break out in a school. Because we notice Zacchaeus and we let the Holy Spirit lead us to pursue and invite them to follow him. That's what Jesus can do. And parents, our little children who don't follow Jesus, you know what we can call them? Zacchaeus. For some of us, Zacchaeus lives with us. So may we be parents who are pursuing and inviting our children to follow Jesus. And we're going to sing a song. And as we sing this song, maybe you just need prayer, especially if, if you're in education in some way. We would just be honored if you just come from the lobby, from this back corner, from the front row. If you just come to the back, we'd just love to just pray over you. If you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus, man, we'd love to talk with you about that. And as we sing this song, this song is about the fact that Jesus came once and Jesus is coming 
again. And here's what's going to happen. When Jesus comes again, Paul tells us that every knee will bow. In other words, one day, everybody's going to see him coming back, the nail scars in his hands. They're going to see him in strength and wisdom and power and glory. And they won't be able to help it. They will fall down and declare that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is worthy. He alone is holy. It will happen. So one of the reasons we pursue and invite is we want people to bow their knee by choice and not by force. Because when he comes back, it's too late to choose to bow your knee. It's just going to happen. Because we pursue and invite them. We're saying, hey, before he comes, while we still have time, would you surrender to King Jesus and receive the life that he gives. So as we sing this song about his coming, I pray that it just stirs up a zeal and a passion for the Zacchaeuses in our lives. And so to prepare us for that, there's going to be five prayers on the screen. And I'm just going to pray them aloud because it starts by praying first. One of the ways we get our antennas up is we spend time, hopefully every single day, to pray for those whom God misses the most, to pray for the Zacchaeuses in our lives. So here's some prayers if you want to take a picture of them, and if you want to stand, if you want to kneel with me, but let's just take a moment and pray, and then we're going to sing about our coming King. So Father, we just come before you, and we just ask, Father, that you would draw people to your son, Jesus. We know in John 6, that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. So go before us, Father, and draw him to Jesus. Jesus, would you bind the spirit that blinds? I speak Jesus against the demonic activity in their lives that's blinding them from you, and I pray that, Jesus, you would announce you are the stronger one, and you just clear the way, and then you would loose the spirit of adoption, that your spirit would join with their spirit, and they would see the kind of father that you are, and they would cry out, Abba, Father, to their good and perfect Father. I pray for positive encounters with Jesus' followers. I pray that you would give us eyes to see Zacchaeus, give us the ability to slow down and invest in them, and as we spend time with them, let us love them. Let us be the salt and light that you've put us on this earth to do, and Jesus, I just ask that you just release release a spirit of wisdom and of revelation as they look at the horoscope, as they follow TikTok, help them to see that they're actually pursuing you, Jesus, that you are wisdom. And we just pray for that light bulb moment of revelation, that they would see the light of the revelation of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you do it, Jesus, and bring people to know you and be changed by you.